Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Leopoldo, very especially. Thank you very much. This is an issue that is very interesting because when BT toxins appear and were first introduced in the genome in seed breathing, the toxins were a big step forward to limit certain insects' impacts, especially Lepidopterus. That big step avoided quality losses, yield losses, and also reduced herbicides or insecticides applications, which is a big benefit for the environment. <clears throat> we are trying to practice an agriculture that is successfully socially and environmentally. So these tools that came in to the picture many years ago gave us a new possibility. At the time, we thought this was kind of magic. But behind each solution, there are problems. So after some years, sometimes we think that we did not follow certain restrictions or certain basic concepts such as shelters. And we saw that some of the toxins that were used, that were being used, we're not controlling the, the pests as we expected. The first step was to use other toxins. The next step to reinforce the concept of shelters and toxins stacking. So, we ask ourselves, how many toxins are there? How far can this give us a solution? Well, thanks to researchers like Leopoldo, who identify the toxins, we know that there is still hope. We can continue thinking that these uh, tools will be present in our seeds. Therefore, welcome, Leopoldo, and please take the floor and tell us about this future. Good morning. Let me first thank you for the invitation. Thank Abrasid for the invitation. I'm very happy for being here. I don't have much time for my presentation, but I'll try to review the Bacillus thuringiensis properties and the things uh, or the actions we can take to preserve its potential. I'd like to highlight the properties of this biological resource because it is the main tool for weed biological control. In 2014-2015 uh, growing year, we produced about 116 million tons. That is the total production in Argentina basically soybean, followed by 30 million tons of corn and 10 million tons of wheat. However, this uh, quality production is closely linked to the application of chemical insecticides, many different ones, organochlorine, organophosphate, uh, the chemical insecticides are 
phytosanitary products widely used in agriculture combined with others such as fungicides and insecticides. So in 2009, 30 million tons of these products were used in Argentina that represented $260 million. These products, many times, because of its uh, improper and excessive application, can contaminate vegetables and water and end up in our tables. Therefore, human beings need these products insecticides to reduce the negative impact of insects on crops and bring them to economically acceptable levels. This contaminates the soil, water resources, breeds or brings about resistant insects, affects other insects that are not negative for our crops and of course somehow has a negative impact on human health and create um, temporary problems or even cancer. The alternative to chemical control exists. It is impossible to consider that certain pests and insects that affect crop can be controlled without chemicals. But we can reduce applications, we can reduce the rates. We have to use environmentally friendly methods to have sustainable agricultural practices. These are biological controls, such as predators or parasitoids, and microorganisms that affect the pathogens, some organisms that produce the, this, that can kill the pest that affects agriculture. This pyramid shows the different microorganisms that can biologically control our um, pests. You have some protozoas, fung fungi, viruses, nematodes, and of course, bacteria. Those are the ones most widely used. Just to show you, we already have some protozoas that are available in the market. Fungi, we have certain species which are quite interesting to control Lepidopterus and Colopterus. The Baku viruses that can control Lepidopterus. And we have the nematodes, endopathogenous nem nematodes. These are not path pathogens per se. They depend upon bacteria, which really produce the death of insects, but they are symbiotically linked. There is an intimate relationship between the bacteria and the nematode to kill the insect. The cenobardos are um, linked to Steneiderma. How do they behave? Well, this is a symbiotic association. It's really interesting when the nematode penetrates the, the insect that is shown on the slide by this um, circle, it regurgitates. I don't know if you can see it regurgitates the bacteria, and the bacteria is the toxic element for the insect and kills it. But this bacteria cannot be defined as a biological resource to control pests because they are closely linked to the nematode. But we can mention entomopathogenous bacteria such as Aspanibacillus propylia or Lysinibacillus sphericus, which create a pathogenic effect on um, pests. These three bacteria 
have a host effect which is different the penibacillus are pathogens against certain coleopterus the aspherichus against dipterus and the thuringiensis is able to affect Lepidopterus, Coleopterus, Dipteras, Emipteras, and Nematodes. In 2014, about $1.4 billion in, of biological uh, control products were marketed, and in 2019, estimates say that this will increase to by 13.4%, and the most marketed products are those based on Bt. Bacillus thuringiensis was discovered in 1901 by a Japanese researcher that was, he isolated this from Bombix moria and called it Bacillus soto. His research was not well known because the researcher published this in Japanese. In 1915, another researcher isolated this from Ephestia and called it Bacillus thuringiensis because he did, it there. he did this in Thuringia. In 1930, the first uh, biological control trial started on Limandria and Ostrinia. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria, a gram-positive bacteria. It can produce certain spores, a sporal effect with Cree components. These are endotoxins that are toxic for insects. This bacteria can produce a large volume of protein, it's up to 25% of its dry weight. The classification is this one. It is Bacillus serius, and it goes together with anthracis and thuringiensis, together with cirrus. So some researchers have said that essentially they are the same species. The only difference is pathogenicity. The biological cycle has two phases, a vegetative growth phase where it can produce some toxins that are secreted on the crop until it finds favorable environmental condition and it sporulates. And there it frees the spora and as any other bacteria, it finds environmentally friendly condition and it germinates. Ecologically, we can say that the cycle is more complex it is still to be properly known, but it needs um, hosts to continue living, but it can also grow in the soil. The genoma is circular from 5.2 MB. It is mostly accompanied by DNA. Uh, small chromosomes in variable numbers. These are plasmids, and these m accompanying molecules code, code the genes that produce the Bt proteins. As you can see, in the circle, you can find more than one toxin in the plasmid of the same or of different types. These plasmid were tested artificially in the lab, but it's probable that in nature is the same and they can move thuringiensis to a cirrus and from a cirrus can reconvert into thuringiensis and they were introduced in anthracis too. So these plasmids are a source of genetic variability that can produce new toxins. In the sporulation, you have these toxins that are insecticides, three main families. The ones that are most widely studied are the Cree, they have amino acid sequence that keep three preserved domains. 
then the CRE toxins without the three domains in the spherical and the CIT. So far, we've uh, um, 74 CREs have been described, uh, 74 subfamilies of CREs toxins. So the effect is quite narrow, but it can affect coleopterus, dipterus, lepidopterus, and even cancer cells. How do they behave? Well, similar to other toxins, there is a protoxin that is inactive and a post-translational effect that is trans um, translational. It is a part. It affects the insect, and part of the toxin is removed and activated. So we have three preserved domains. Number one is the perforator because it perforates the insect number two is responsible for the interaction of the toxin and number three it shares what the other two do so when a susceptible insect eats something like this the crystal solubilize in the insect the protoxin activates and depending on the cell receptors, they create the porums, and there is an osmotic effect. So the insect cannot assimilate food and dies. Another possibility for less susceptible species, the spores that are ingested can find an optimum environment to germinate, can go through the intestinal wall as a vegetative cell and then kill the insect. During the vegetative state, other toxins occur. These are the vegetative proteins. VIP1, VIP2, VIP3, and VIP3. VIP1 and VIP2 are binary toxins. They generate together the toxic effect. VIP4 uh, have been recently discovered, so there's not much information about them so far. And finally, we have another secretable toxins that have another to you with the vegetative. These are uh, secretable uh, proteins. These are one of the uh, strangest toxins because they don't crystallize. Specifica contra el epidóptero. Este es el modo de acción de las toxinas VIP1 y VIP2. Que le dé más volumen. Protein VIP1. produces a modification of the skeleton and cerebral uh, death. These other uh, work in a similar way as the Cree. It uh, forms the pore and it, in this uh, slide, we can see how the uh, intestine of a susceptible insect is modified. Here we see how the intestine is normal. The uh, column cells are intact. The matrix of the peritrophic membrane is intact. In the second image, with even intoxicated larva for 24 hours, and we have the swelling of the cells with liquid going into them. This occurs over 24 hours. In the third photograph, there is a disruption of the peritrophic membranes. The column cells starts to become smooth, and uh, here the larva is already dead. This is three days period. Mortality occurs in three days. These uh, uh, creeped um, element has an effect 
which is known as a detergent effect. The mechanism is not very specific. This toxins are uh, um, specific in vitro, but not in vivo. There are also other non-protein um, proteins of low weight that are produced by bacillus thuringiensis. They are not desirable. They interfere with the normal synthesis of a DNA. They are thermoresistance, and they are believed to uh, affect a invertebrates, so these are used to spray on uh, crops. These toxins are named following a nomenclature that is established by the International Committee of Nomenclature. This naming is based on the similarity with other toxins that have already been discovered. The name of the toxin plus four digits plus one letter and uh, one more uh, number. The uh, letter goes first in uppercase and then in lowercase. There is the possibility to uh, have a synergy combining the toxins. This is very important and is taken into account to design and produce a GM crops of second generation, combining two different toxins with different mode of actions to delay the development of resistance or it happens that a toxins a sip with toxins script uh, have a different effect when they go together. Bacillus thuringiensis then was con was traded only in 1938 by Sporane in France. Two or, three, two or three years later, the FDA in U.S. approved its marketing. So it started to be produced under different brand names. It was it was a sprayable product. The active ingredient was the mixture of spores, crystals. The main advantage is that they were specific against uh, pest insects, not a, against a beneficial insects as pollinizing insects. Uh, the, you have to wait between the application of the spray until the harvest, so it is uh, apt to be used for integrated pest management. It inactivates the spores, and both uh, spores and crystals are easily washed with rainfall, so the availability in the field is only seven days. This BioBT uh, first generation insecticides were produced in a reactor. Then it was dried, the, the precipitate was dried, and this became the active ingredient of the insecticide that could be combined with an adjuvant to uh, increase its water solubility or to increase its storage period. Later, a GM um, crops were developed in 1996. We had the first GM crops as uh, the BT corn, also potato and cotton. Right now, we have a broader range of intensive crops or extensive ones resistant to BT uh, insects. The common denominator here is that basically all of them use the same toxin, Cry-1A, except the potato that uses the Cry-3 that uh, is active against coleopters. The continuous use of the same toxins, both in uh, plants or in formulations, it started to provide uh, the capacity to insects to develop resistance to the most used toxins. So by 2011, 
BT crop production in the world was 16 million tons, but in this chart shows us that the use or the production of BT crops had uh, increased exponentially, but uh, the same happened with the resistant insects. Uh, practical resistant types were described in several countries, including US and Brazil. Practical resistant is where more than 50% of uh, the individuals of a species resist to the BT crop, and uh, so the efficacy of this is less, is also reduced. In this table, we have the most used um, toxins and where a resistance occurs and what type of resistance. Considering all this, uh, by 2003, the second generation crops were developed. These are crops, these are pyramid crops that produce more than one BT toxin. <coughs> these toxins have different mode of functions, at different receptors to avoid cross resistance, and they have activity against the same species in order to uh, delay, not abolish, but at least a delay the development of resistance. One of the clearest examples is the second generation BT cotton that uh, produced the uh, CRY1AC, CRY2AB, and VIP3A. They have different effects when they bind different receptors. Their resistance to BT insecticides can occur in any stage of the mode of action of the toxin. When the crystal solubilizes in the digestive tract, if the insect changes the pH, if the insect modifies the proteases uh, or any um, adaptive uh, mutation occurs that modifies the intestine proteases, or when the uh, toxin joins or binds, sorry, the receptor, if the receptor changes, the, uh, this also could change. The insect has the capability to the capability to regenerate the damaged intestine. It, this has been uh, resumed or summarized in three points. In the receptor, in the uh, proteolytic uh, capacity and in the capacity to bind the receptor. Uh, the, the most important is the inhibition of the uh, toxin binding to the receptor. Some cry toxins share receptors. Probably cross resistance could occur, but it is not a recommended to use these toxins in second generation crops, but uh, it is recommended to use them in the ones that are depicted in red because they have a receptor of their own. Uh, here we have combination with secretable toxins. And given the high capacity of insects to develop resistance to chemical insecticides and BT um, uh, resistance, so different uh, technologies have been developed to approach this type of cross resistance. So it is clear that we have a problem because insect, insects manage to Resist, resist BT toxins probably the uh, the reason is the continued uh, application of of these um, products so because insects uh, develop resistance the solution is that we need to uh, delay the development of a resistance at the same time as we keep the power of the insecticides. In a, every pathogen system, there is an evolution between the west fed and the pathogen in this case. 
the insect will try to resist the action of the bacteria, and the bacteria will have to change its tools in order to overcome the resistance of the Western. Uh, we find a high number of uh, cry-type um, toxins that are the result of this constant evolution. Last year, we have 760 different subtypes of cry toxins, and this year, the, we have already more than 800. So this shows what happens or uh, with the um, constant evolution of the bacillus thuringiensis to modify the toxins and continue fighting insects. We may consider as possible solutions is that we can continue using different uh, toxins, high rates of toxins, uh, shelters, try to um, resource to breeding in order to modify these toxins in the laboratory, but in order to uh, reduce the reliance that we have on the most used toxins, this year we have introduced new BT strains with new specificities and with a different host uh, effect modes. I've been working until 2014 with this objective in the Public University of Navarra in Spain. We uh, have a BT collection of more than 2,000 strains. Uh, thanks to Conices, this was uh, brought to Argentina last year. My uh, working plan consists in isolating new BT uh, strains. Uh, uh, we have the, the collection is uh, uh, we do the collection collecting insects that uh, could have died uh, from BT in the soil or also rest or rest of uh, product in the silos. Last year when uh, I joined the um, uh, agricultural school of the Litoral University, I found a BT that had uh, activity to a specific pathogen, against a specific pathogen. You know that BT soybean is well known because soybean is a very popular crop in Argentina. The GM soybean is unable to control the S. cosmiotis. And it only um, uh, it only uh, suppresses HCA. Strains that don't have parasporal crystal uh, have a potential to uh, control phytopathogen fungi. Uh, we have conducted a study in a soil in Cordoba that has a high potential for this. Uh, therefore, this bacteria, the uh, DNA of these bacteria were isolated and in a collaboration with the Villa Maria University, the Navarra University, and the research group of the CONICET, we were able to send the DNA of these uh, strains to a research group. We also um, required an authorization to continue researching with the technological university and other first line companies, Naturalis and the other one that appears there. Why, phenom the, why do we sequence genoma? Uh, the, they are quite uh, cheaper. It's only 60 pounds, the genoma in Europe. The genoma sequencing is all an uh, almost perfect tool because it is far cheaper now and it gives us um, a general overview of the gene contents of all those bacteria. In Bt tunisensis, we are going to have 
complete genes uh, that can be cloned, can be reproduced, and we can determine what are their capacity to resist insecticides. The chaperones P19 and P20 and enzymes and other proteins that can have activities that are useful in biotechnology, promoters and transposons that can uh, build uh, expressions and, as I said, transposons that are inserted in these insecticide plasmides that are a good source of viability. So very quickly, let me summarize P19 in P20. They help to intensis produce uh, insecticide proteins. It can have synergism with CRY and CIT to produce uh, BT strains cocktails. The enzymes are enzymes that favor the toxins. They are in the baculus virus. They can induce, uh, they can stop growth and induce death. And these are peptides that protect the intestine and can favor the binding of the toxin. In yet another cooperation work, considering that tox BT toxins so far we want to change the combination. So in cooperation with Cardiff University, we have sequenced 15 bacterial strains. Leonardo del Valle helped us. And we got these populations because we need to know the insecticide potential of these bacteria because they cannot be used by themselves in formulation. So we found 99 potential insecticide genes, or I genes as we call them, together with the sequence genomas, the BT sequence genomas, and the bacteria with the capability of um, having insecticide effects, we may clone them, express the protein, and determine their activity against uh, pests. <clears throat> we believe that as the second generation GMOs uh, crops have been created, we have uh, resistances. So maybe we can introduce some toxins uh, just as an attempt to delay the um, resistance to turingensis and prolong its insecticide potency. Thank you very much. Bueno, eh, tenemos algo, eh, we have some minutes left for questions. As we show the questions on the screen, let me tell you that it's really interesting to see the prospects that you are showing us. And I have many concerns, many questions more than concerns. One question is, how do you, do you think that any of these proteins will be available to introduce them in a genoma. How long do you think this will take so that uh, those of us who are listening to you can have an idea of the future? Time uh, in a laboratory that is actively working on a topic uh, such as the one I worked in uh, Spain, we may be talking about two years to have a, a toxin that is properly fertilized. The lab in Spain has uh, Coleopterus, uh, uh, Septarium, 
So when you need something, we could pick up the phone and ask them to send us something. So times are getting shorter and shorter. We are now just uh, kind of a starting. So we may say that probably in three, four years, with the cooperation of our, our European colleagues, we may have a, an interesting result. But I cannot say, because you have to protect intellectual property, and you have many other issues to, to consider. And we have biosecurity issues here. So those bacteria will have to be assessed from the biosafety perspective. Should we eliminate from the market toxins that do not provide good control on Spodoptera? I think this question refers possibly to the stacking of the protein stacking. If you have a protein in one biotechnological product, that protein, which is CRY1, for instance, is it OK to add a BIP, or is it preferable to remove it? I think that is the aim of the question. If we know that protein stacking is a good strategy to delay resistance, but are we really stacking when one of the proteins in that stacking is a protein that we know does not work? I believe that toxins that do not work, there's no reason to keep them. Not in a transgenic uh, crop, uh, an heterologous protein, but a protein from a different uh, organism always have some cost in fitness. So the toxins that we know have no activity or that have uh, zero activity, I think they should be removed and stop using them. Therefore, the need to find new strains, new genes that can replace them. This is kind of a war between a pathogen and antibiotic. When the antibiotic stops working, long before we have to start searching a solution. So the answer is, it is not good to keep them in the stacking because they do not uh, give any advantage. So from the ecological and biosafety point of view, you believe it is preferable to remove them, just considering the antibiotic. They are a burden, but from the biosafety perspective, these are not uh, bringing advantages. Cree toxi toxins have been widely studied. It is uh, already demonstrated that they present no danger for human beings. Therefore, removing a toxin and replacing it by a different one many times makes no sense, though we, of course, can um, do studies to to be certain, but bacillus toxins, it's very much demonstrated they are not a problem. If uh, they present zero activity, many times there can be a toxic effect because the toxin is very active and from another that has a different moderation. So you are attacking the insect on two different fronts, and you really create the possibility of resistance. Sometimes uh, we have demonstrated with BT and second generation corn that uh, the exclusive continued massive use worldwide of all the same toxins will bring resistance. 
One more question. What's the relevance of shelters to keep the control capacity of the genes? What other delaying strategies, resistance delaying strategies exist? The shelter, the non-transgenic shelter, keeps a susceptible population so that you can cross it and delay resistance to keep susceptibility. Other modes are increasing um, high rates of very active toxins. It's like an antibiotic. If we use fatal rates, or the body will develop resistance. And the other, if you can show the question again. Uh, the other strategies, it was about the other delaying strategies. Yes, other mechanisms are toxins that have a different mode of action. A toxin with a different mode of action delays the development of resistance. Any other question? Okay, since there are no more questions, thank you very much once again. I commend your work, I congratulate you, and we hope to have good results very quickly.